Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone to our GI knowledge sessions. These are a series of talks and seminars about gemology that are fueled by our decades of research. And you know, at GI, we consider ourselves very fortunate to be able to study and learn from GEMS. And it's our mission to share our discoveries with the world. So I'm really excited to kick things off today. I'm Kelly Giordano, a member of the content team here at GIA. And I'm joined today by Dr. Aaron Palke, Wimber Triest, and Robert Weldon. And they are gonna give you an absolute incredible look behind the scenes, sharing never before told stories from their field gemology expeditions. So before we get started, there's just a bit of housekeeping. Uh, everyone attending this is automatically muted. So if you have a question, please submit it using the Q&A feature you'll see at the bottom of your screen. And feel free to ask questions as we go. Uh, there will be a Q&A session at the end, <clears throat> excuse me, where Aaron, Wim, and Robert will all have an opportunity to answer some of your questions. We may not get to them all, but I will try to get it to as many as we can. Uh, we'll also share a recording of the session with you later today or early tomorrow morning, and that message will also have a survey, so we would love to hear your feedback. And with that, I'm going to pass you over to Robert. Okay, I think I'm there. No, I'm going to introduce myself right now, and uh, I'm trying to get the, the slide, the next slide going. There we go. All right. Well, listen, uh, hi, everyone. Thanks so much for being here today. We really are hoping to keep you on the edge of your seats wherever you are around the world. Not so much because of the science of gemology or geology, but because when we travel to these distant exotic places around the globe, we don't just return with study samples. We return with thousands of images from these trips, which touch on cultural and human aspects, as well as just the sheer beauty of the places that we're visiting. Uh, only a few of those images make it into Gems and Gemology, GIA scholarly publication, or into our course materials. So today we're going to short, share a few of those stories with you. Uh, here's how we're going to do it. You'll see an image on the screen and the photographer, that's either Aaron Palke or Wim Fertriest or me, Robert Weldon, will tell you the story about that image. The presentation itself is divided into sections, uh, such as images from the road, or scenes to the mines, or people in the field. So let's get started kicking it off with Wim for Triest. All right. Well, good morning and good evening, everyone. Well, first of all, thanks for joining. I think I, think I speak for the three of us. So I think it's a natural start that we start on the road with images that we take from the car, what is happening. Um, so this is a photo that I took, I think last year, maybe two years ago, when we were visiting Myanmar. So this is not an image that most people will associate with Myanmar. But this is actually the capital of Myanmar, a city called Naypyidaw. And it's one of the strangest places I've been in my life. Um, Naypyidaw wasn't even in existence about 20 years ago, but it was a city completely built artificially, which means that it is very young, it is... Uh, brand new, but there's almost no people living there. So that city is actually way too big for the population, population that mainly consists of government personnel. The parliament is housed there, all the ministries are, mine, are housed there. So the people uh, from the government that work with Gemstones, Geological Service, they're all based there. But that gives you um, some of the most um, weird scenes that we've seen during our travels, where we're driving down this eight, um, eight lane boulevard and that's eight lanes in every direction so there's eight lanes going out eight lanes coming in and there's absolutely no other traffic to be seen and just to give you some information this is taken at 8 30 in the morning like imagine any other main road in any other capital in the world at 8 30 in the morning on a weekday that should be jam-packed and peak traffic hour so this is just one of those weird scenes where we're driving on this eight lane road for an hour and we only cross four other vehicles. Now, if you look at the next photo, that is actually the complete opposite. This photo was taken in Ethiopia, Northern Ethiopia, close to the border with Eritrea, where there are basically no roads. Uh, the only vehicles that can really drive there are rugged four-wheel drives. Um, 
but a lot of people either can't afford them. And even if you could afford like a motorcycle or something, uh, fuel supply isn't always guaranteed. So a lot of people still rely on the traditional methods of transportation, which is just carrying everything on your back or using beasts of burden. So this family is traveling to the weekly market. Uh, they come from miles away. They live in a small farm out in the very arid desert. But every Saturday, there's a market in the town called Chila where they go to trade their goods. That could be clothing, that could be construction material, cooking material, things they farmed. And since the last years, also sapphires. So those sapphires provide an additional income for those people, an additional source of money that they can use to lift their standard of living. But you see that those people, this entire family, is still walking to that market using the traditional ways. Now this is another picture that I took out of the car window while we were driving. We didn't even stop for this. I don't even remember where exactly it is. It is somewhere in Northern Tanzania, but I was dozing off because it was early morning and I wake up, look out the window and I see this scene. I quickly snapped a picture of it. I think these are the foothills of Mount Kilimanjaro, but I'm not sure anymore. But this image always reminds me of Africa. Africa with its mysteriousness, with its grandeur, with its rugged beauty. And I think a lot of that comes out in this uh, photo. And I paired it with this quote that I've seen for the first time on the back of a safari van. And that says that the only man I envy is the man who has not yet been to Africa, for he has so much to look forward to. And I think for me, that, that really shows this photo. If you show this photo to people, to people, they will immediately appreciate it. The wide open spaces, the rugged nature, the beautiful lighting, just the feeling of open space and that wild feeling that you still have there. I think that shows very nicely in this photo. Now, I'm not always dozing off in the car and snapping quick pictures. This is a picture that I also took from the car window. Uh, we were driving down from the Longido Ruby Mines and we're looking outside because we know this is an area that is very famous for its wildlife. You're in the border of Kenya and Tanzania which hosts some of the most magnificent natural reserves in the world, like the Serengeti, like Ngorongoro Crater, the Tsavo National Park. So you know there's a large chance to spot wildlife. So I'm looking outside and on the right side of the road, there's this hill. And all of a sudden we see a giraffe on that hill. So we stop the car and we take a better look and we count more than 24 giraffes. So there's this herd of 24 giraffes coming down the hill, browsing on some trees, eating some leaves. And they actually wanted to cross the road, the road which is the highway um, from the Kenyan capital, Nairobi, to Arusha. So you can see that these giraffes cross that road to get to the water hole, which is on the right side here. Um, but this is a major highway in East Africa. But people that drive there regularly, they know that there's high chance that you will cross animals there, whether that is domestic, uh, like sheep or goats or wildlife like giraffes or antelopes or ostrich, all animals we saw next to that road. So here you can see this huge male giraffe who is leading his herd across the highway while this truck is stopping for him um, and letting him pass. So that is just one of the examples of living with that natural beauty, with that wilderness that you can still find in Africa in places where you're not always expecting it. Now, of course, when we take those roads, we always try to get to the mines. Uh, the mines are what we're going for. So the next section will just show you some images from things that we've seen at the mine, nice stories that we've witnessed while people were mining, while we were visiting those mines. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I'll just jump in here and say, you know, not all miners, actual miners think this way. That's a Walt Disney um, point perspective. Most miners have a saying, and that is uh, the definition of a mine is a, is a hole in the ground through which you pour a lot of money. So uh, I'm gonna start off this section with this photo. And I would say off the bat that this photo doesn't really fit the description of the title of the talk, which is behind the scenes of field gemology. Um, and the reason is that everybody loves a blast, right? A blast is, a photo of a blast is one of the best ways of trying to 
trying to transport somebody to the mind to, to you know, give them the feeling that they're there in the moment, in the action with all that drama and, and force going on. Um, but the next photo I'm gonna show is more behind the scenes. And so what this next photo is, is sort of um, showing the lead up to the blast. And so you see these two guys, these two miners. And what these guys are doing, these guys are preparing the blast. Um, and what is contained in that little box in the center of the photo, those little pink tubes, that's the explosives. Um, and so if, before I did field gemology, I hadn't been to too many mines. I hadn't seen a lot of this preparation going on. And it's a little bit nerve wracking when you first get to the mines and you start seeing these guys uh, preparing these, these blasts. Because if you think about it, in that box with all those pink tubes, that's all of the force, all of the power that you saw in the previous photo. It, all of that energy is contained right in that little box. And so these guys are, you know, trained experts, of course, but they're, it almost looks very casual when you see them, you know, see these pink tubes just kind of scattered around the ground. Um, however, I would point out these guys are trained experts. They've gone through a lot of training to be able to do these blasts carefully. Um, and they are very um, cautious and uh, about it, but it's just still, when you get there and you see this guy holding in his hand all of that explosives, it really kind of, um, it moves you a little bit and it makes you, you think about how these gemstones are coming from the ground and ending up in the jewelry stores and in our hands. And uh, this is Wim's photo, yeah. Um, so I think this photo really shows also what Aaron was saying, that you need to realize the effort the energy that goes into mining a gemstone and the hands that it passes through before a gemstone reaches the public. So this is a photo that I took in Pailin, Cambodia, an area where um, rubies, but mainly sapphires are mined. Um, and those sapphires nowadays are mined from river deposits. So when you go there, you see a lot of people washing gravel in the river. So they go down with long with shovels with long sticks, bring up the gravel and then wash it in baskets. So these guys are always doing rough work in the water. And that's something you can really see in this guy's hand. So he was washing it the whole day. And at the end of the day, he pulls out this really small, but really, really nice, very beautifully colored uh, piece of blue sapphire. And he showed it to me. And that just realized that. In this photo, you can see how much energy, how much effort, how much muscle power, how much strenuous work goes into finding even one tiny gemstone. And I think that's something you need to realize next time you walk into a jewelry store or even into a gem show. If you look at that abundance of gemstones there, think about all the energy, the power that it went, that went into finding that gemstone and bringing it all the way to the surface. Not only mining, which we're talking about now, but also local trading, international trading, cutting, treating, more international trading. So gems, there's a lot of effort being that people put into those gems before they actually reach the jewelry that they're meant to be in. And in this next photo, this next series of photos, I kind of want to tell a little, a little bit of a story. Um, I really like how Wim started this all off with On the Road. Um, and as Wim pointed out, you know, you can take several days just getting to the mine. And all this time when you're on the road traveling to the mine, you're building up this anticipation. And this is what this story is about, is anticipation and the build up to the moment of getting to the mine and starting the field expedition. And this is a photo outside the vortex shaft of the Yogo Gulch mine in Montana. And this is really, I'd been fascinated with Yogo Gulch sapphires for the longest time. Um, and in 2017, a local jeweler out of Bozeman, Montana, actually purchased the Vortex mine and reopened it. And so we finally got this opportunity to come to the mine that I'd been dreaming about for years. Um, and I think, you know, the field expedition in my mind started right here. So this, this photo right outside the Vortex shaft with these big imposing gates, keep out, no trespassing. Um, and as the guy, the owner of the mine started opening up the gates, um, and the next photo shows the gates opening a little bit. And this anticipation just builds and we're reaching the moment of climax when finally the gates open in the next photo and we walk inside the mine. Um, 
And this was, in my mind, this was when the field expedition started. Um, and one thing in the next photo I want to kind of point out with this is what these guys are looking for in this mine. It's the Yogo Gulch mine is the sapphires are contained in this dike. And so you see this yellow vein cutting through here. This is a, a dike of a volcanic rock that's carrying the sapphires. It's about a foot wide maybe. But as we're walking down this mine, we're going through these huge adits, 15 foot adits that somebody carved out of solid rock. And it, and it really struck me in this specific field expedition uh, when we saw this, that how hard mining is and how risky it is. And, and it, it struck me, you know, how much effort we go to to get these shiny blue pebbles out of the ground. When you think about it, cutting these 15 foot shafts into, in, into solid rock to get at this one foot wide dike in which the dike itself has a low concentration of sapphires. You know, you really have to be motivated and passionate about what you're doing in order to take that risk and to, to make all that effort. So I think this, this is a picture that I took uh, and I think it, it follows up perfectly with what Aaron was saying is that the amount of energy, the buildup that people go through to find these stones, the amount of material that is moved. This is a photo that I took in Mogok, Myanmar, down in the Dato mine. The Dato mine is one of the most legendary mines in all of Mogok with a fabled history, produced some of the most famous specimens and ruby gems um, that are out there in the world. But they've been working that, that mine for maybe even centuries. And they've been digging in this hard rock, hard rock, uh, full marble, that people are digging tunnels through to find these rubies. So these rubies are extremely rare within that marble, but these people put all the effort in to get that very low concentration of rubies, which is usually not even gem grade, out of those rocks. So here you can see this really complex set of tunnels where they all meet together. So this is a bit of a central room where this miner is standing. But you can see that over his shoulder, there's this winch where there's a tunnel going up. Then to the left of him where that hook is hanging, there's another tunnel that goes down there. Then you have these bags full of rock here. There's this rope that leads down to another tunnel. If you go look at the right bottom, um, the, the yeah, right bottom corner where that more darker rock is, that's another tunnel that goes down. And then where that light is hanging, you can see that there's a wire going down. There's another tunnel going down. And then I myself, I'm standing in another tunnel to take this photo. So this is like seven tunnels that meet hundreds of meters deep in this mountain of massive marble where people are searching for that ruby and advancing meter by meter to get those rubies out. And they've been doing that for decades, maybe even centuries. And so I'm gonna do another series of photos, which is gonna tell a different story. And so the story here is sort of predicated on the notion that um, at heart, every man in the world is essentially a five-year-old boy trapped in a grown man's body. Um, and so that being said, one of the things when we first get to the mine sites, one of the things I'm always drawn to first is the big machines. Um, I love the big machines and you know, it's, but I think there's a little more to it than just this boyhood obsession with machines and things that make a lot of noise. Um, if you really think about it, you look at some of these photos, there's something elegant in these big machines. Um, from the soft purr of an idling engine to the graceful swooping arm of, a, of an excavator. Um, in these photos, I want to kind of show the, how you can look at these big machines in the context of these mines and, um, and appreciate the beauty with them. Um, and this next photo shows one of the things that I like that is highlighted well by these big machines, which is uh, contrast. And so this is a photo in the uh, Demantoid mine in Russia, um, in the Polnavai Demantoid mine in Russia. And if you go to the mine, it's, it's um, in the summer, it's this serpentinite rock. So it's this kind of dull, drab, white, maybe tannish kind of rock. It's not uh, terribly attractive for a photo in many cases. However, with these, these big machines in the mines, um, it provides this nice contrast of color that can oftentimes give you a very attractive photo. And I'll just, I'll follow it up with one last photo of these big machines. Um, this, the next photo is taken in Tanzania at a mine site. And these guys were working all through the day and all through the night. Um, and this was a photo we took as the, um, we were kind of finishing up the work that day. 
Um, but these guys were just going at it and they wouldn't stop, you know, in their pursuit of these gemstones. Um, and I just, I thought this was a really nice photo kind of illustrating where the stones come from and how we get the stones out of the ground. The, the ruby fever, as they call it. <laughs> Very good. And you know what, for the first time, I'm beginning to look at those big machines as sexy. <laughs> So now we're going to talk a little bit about the people that we meet in the field. And it's, it's always fascinating. I love that proverb. And so I'm going to follow up with one more photo uh, taken in Russia. And in the last couple of years, we've been to Russia twice on field expeditions uh, in order to visit the Demantoid mines and the Emerald mine in the Ural Mountains near the city of Yekaterinburg. Uh, but however, the first time we got to, the, to Russia to visit these mines, we couldn't actually get access to the Emerald Mine. We didn't go there until the second time, but and it was kind of a bummer, but uh, eventually we ran into this guy um, who agreed to show us around the area around the, the Emerald Mines. And this was, this guy, he was a geologist back in the day, back in Soviet times. He was actually an exploration guy working for the Emerald Mines. And, he agreed to show us around and give us a little bit of a tour of, of what was going on and give us some background information on emerald mining in the area. Um, and he didn't speak much English. So we were sitting there, he was talking to us very passionately with a lot of energy, telling us all the information he knew about the emerald mines. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't really understand what he was saying, but we got it all on video. And um, the story kind of starts with, I took the video back. My wife is actually Russian. So she helped us translate the videos when we got back. And so we were watching the video, she was translating, and then she starts laughing. And apparently what happened was the guy said to our guide, Alexei, he said to him in Russian, he said, he'd been talking for a while, and he said, do they understand what I'm saying? And Alexei, Alexei laughed, and he said, no, of course not. And I, I felt a little bit bad for the guy, but, you know, he, he didn't miss a beat. This guy just kept going on. He didn't, he didn't care that we didn't really understand what he was saying. He just kept going on and giving us all this information. Uh, he loved having us as, as an audience. And uh, we really appreciated his passion and his enthusiasm. Uh, there's a, definitely a teacher in everybody. Uh, Aaron, I just wanted to ask you, there's two pictures that are on that uh, board there, uh, or actually four pictures. Uh, so I'm seeing the emerald sample, but I think the other two are Alexandrites, right? Yeah, on the, on the right hand side of that placard uh, is an al our Alexandrite photos. And uh, the Alexandrite are found in the same mines where the emeralds are also found. And we saw that later when we came the next year. Um, they are producing small amounts of Russian Alexandrite from the emerald mine as well. Cool. Yeah, I, I really love this photo because I mean, we meet this guy in the middle of the forest somewhere in Russia. Um, and he's obviously not expecting company but he has this explanation locked and loaded the guy is prepared i mean he has his stick right there to point at the board this is what we're talking about this is what we're talking about he even has that board standing there in the middle of the forest so i think this guy has he's had his explanation ready ever since the soviet union fell and was just waiting <laughs> for not we're the first people to show up there in 25 30 years and he, he just couldn't care less that we didn't speak any Russian. And he just went for it and did his whole explanation. And I'm sure it was perfect. But unfortunately, my Russian is not perfect. So I didn't understand a word of it. <laughs> All right. And now on to this next picture, which uh, I took. The picture on the left is a picture of a man uh, that I photographed about 30 years ago, three decades ago. Um, he was at a mine in Kangala in Tanzania, and he had just come out of the ground and he had this incredible rotolite in his hand. So I asked him to pose and we took a picture. Uh, then we took pictures, a series of pictures of the various gems that he and other miners had mined. And then we got in the car and we went away. And I realized after I got back and had the films developed that I never knew his name. I didn't know who he was. For all I knew, uh, a decade later, some woman in New York City was wearing that beautiful rhodolite faceted as a gem around her neck or on her finger. And it, it occurs to me that we, we often overlook the very, very crucial people at the beginning of the pipeline. And they're often overlooked and yet they're doing the really heavy work for, for all of us. And I think the vast majority of gemstones do come out of the ground through artisanal miners. 
So with this iconic picture that I took so many years ago, it served almost as, a, as an inspiration uh, for what we were going to do at GIA a few years, uh, many years later, a few years ago. So we developed this artisanal mining guide and you can see here uh, on the right, there's a picture of the, the guide itself uh, and a tray that comes with it. And you may have heard about this, but uh, many of us at GIA, including Wim and myself, are, are going out into the field and we are delivering uh, classes to the miners so that they can really better understand uh, factors of value with regards to the gemstones they're mining. And this has been very, very helpful to them. They've been able to, to treble their, treble their, their income capacity. We didn't do this alone. We did it with a fantastic NGO called PACT. And they've been our partners in this, helping us get to these, these far-flung communities all around the world. But of course, we've been, we've been concentrating on Africa for this part of it. So fast forward uh, 30 years from that original photo. And, and here we have miners just like that first man whose name we, we didn't know. Uh, all gathered under a beautiful acacia tree at the Lemshuku mine in Tanzania. And at that point, we were expecting about 300 miners. Uh, some 800 to 1,000 people showed up, uh, totally overwhelming the capacity of um, distribution that we had. But it's just amazing what the need is for, for education in some of those, those areas. Now, unbeknownst to me, uh, our colleague uh, at PACT uh, had decided that he was, and his name is Norbert Massey, he was going to go back and find the first man that I had photographed 30 years ago. And by the way, his image is on the back of the book, sort of as an iconic image to serve as, uh, as the type of person we were trying to help. And to my greatest amazement, he actually found him. So here is his, here is uh, the same man that is pictured in the booklet. And his name is Jalala Mohammed. Uh, he's a little bit worse for wear, but he's, he's definitely the same guy. When he saw that picture on the back of a book, he was just totally floored and amazed. And, and we gave him a couple of copies. And then he, he joined us on one of those expeditions to to the mine, our training expeditions. And when he came back, he mentioned to us that a book like that would really have helped him. Jalala Mohammed has had a very difficult life, very difficult. He had tuberculosis, he lost a farm, he was cheated on his gemstones, lost a car. He told us all, all measure of stories and, and it was his belief that, that a book like this would really have helped him understand the value factors in those early days. So it's a nice way to come full circle three decades later. And um, speaking of Africa, the man who introduced me to Africa is also the discoverer of Savarite, and that's Campbell Bridges, who unfortunately was, was killed uh, maybe a decade ago. Uh, but he took me to a legendary place when I first visited him in Kenya, and that was his tree house from which he and his wife, Judith, would prospect out in the, in the surrounding area for green garnet. And um, he asked me if I wanted to sleep there and uh, I didn't get a chance to sleep at that, at that tree house, but I always dreamed that I could have. Probably a good thing that I didn't sleep there that day because uh, apparently there was a leopard that had made a, made a nesting spot up in the tree house or close to it. But we did go out to it one morning, very, very early. And just as we clambered to the top of the platform, the sun peeked over the horizon and I could see a giraffe loping across the fields in the distance. And then I heard a lion's roar. And then Campbell said to me, you know, now you really have the true sense of Africa. So that was my, my beginning. And, and I love that quote that uh, Wim had earlier. It's so true. Once Africa gets into your veins, you are, you're, you're a dumb case. You'll, you'll love it forever. 
But then I had a, a chance to go back to the Scorpion mine, which is where he was actually mining the Sabarite, uh, just a few years ago after he was killed. And the house that you see there on the left is the house that I had slept in uh, that, that many years ago, about 30. And uh, Campbell was on the left side of that building snoring away. I was on the right side, but all through the night I heard lions. Uh, they, were, they were actually lions circling our camp and looking for, for grub. Earlier in the day, Campbell had shown me where the bathroom was, which is about uh, two or 300 meters from that place. And he said, you know, just feel free to go there at any, any time. Um, needless to say, I just kept everything in and didn't go anywhere until daylight <laughs> and the lions had left. But that night, um, that many years later, when this picture was taken under that beautiful African sky with all of those, those stars littered like diamonds across its landscape and one candle illuminating the, the tree house, I was able to actually sleep in it. And I started thinking about lions, I started thinking about scorpions, I started thinking about snakes. And I thought I would never be able to sleep there. But then a gentle breeze blew and that house creaked and groaned. And before you know it, I was fast asleep and uh, slept very well. One of the best nights of my life. Well, I guess it's, yeah. yeah. Do you want to set it up, Wim? Yeah, sure. So of course, when we go to the field, it's not all spending the nights in tree houses and driving four wheel trucks. We actually go there to do some work as well. But of course, when you're in an office and you have a nice chair and some air conditioning and everything that you can need and a spacious desk and your colleagues next to you, or you can call someone to help you, uh, those situations don't exist in the field. So this, these photos will give you a bit of an idea of what it's like to actually work in the field. Yeah, and uh, if you don't uh, recognize it, that's me sitting, and I didn't know it at the time, that's a latrine. Uh, my legs are, were sticking into it, but it was a good perch from which I could photograph a spectacular ruby specimen that was uh, leaning against the wall. Actually, that was not an ideal situation, but luckily I had brought in a portable studio. So the picture in the middle, you see the portable studio, and I'm on the ground, literally reclining on the ground, trying to take a picture of the ruby specimen under much more controlled conditions. And the picture on the right is that ruby specimen. And so this is publication quality. And uh, it just goes to show that you can actually uh, have a studio that you can take with you all across the world to do some of the, the studio work that then goes into our publications. This is an incredible ruby. It was about three inches long sitting here in the calcite that Wim described so, so very beautifully in the Datal mine. But you can see that the bottom part of that, that ruby has been broken off. It's unfortunate because the crystal itself nestled as it is in the calcite is absolutely stunning. Now, this is a picture that I took. Uh, maybe you recognize this mine. Uh, Aaron showed some photos earlier of this exact same excavator working in this mine, but that was during summertime. So this is the second expedition that we did in Russia. This was uh, early springtime in the Ural Mountains, um, beginning of April. And we were fortunate enough to be joined by our colleague from the Tokyo lab, Yusuke Katsurada. And Yusuke is an excellent uh, gemologist, geologist, but he's also a world-class artist. Um, he has done a lot of expositions with his drawings and he makes a habit of it to sketch wherever he goes and to make drawings wherever he goes. So usually when you arrive at a mine site, the first thing you do is like try to catch what is going on. Like get some quick overview shots that at least you have that. So we jump out of the car, we're all taking out of our cameras. Uh, there, we had a drone operator with us that was setting up the drone to take off to take some photos and video from the sky. Um, most of us were still putting on our jackets. And in, the, and in all that time, Yusuke just flipped out his notebook and he made this incredible sketch. And I think the next slide shows that, that sketch, that drawing that he made, 
just capturing the essence of that scene. And he had finished that by the time that we had taken our lens caps off our cameras. So that just shows you that sometimes the most simple methods really are sufficient to capture what is going on. You don't need all the high tech material, a decent notebook um, and to make some sketches. And that's where the sketching really, um, really makes you focus on what is going on and really makes you focus on the essence of what is going on. Because a photo just captures everything what is going on. Um, while a sketch, you really need to prioritize. So you can see that he sketched, he focused on that vein in the hole, like the whole forest behind, it's not that important, but it's that vein that goes down where they have that trench. That is what is important. So I think this just shows you that sometimes back to basics is a really good thing, especially in the field. Yes, and um, here we are in the field uh, in Myanmar, Burma, and uh, very close to Mogok in the surrounding area because people don't realize, but every, every speck around uh, Mogok is littered with, with mines, uh, mines for, for rubies and sapphires and peridot and moonstone, a number of different materials. Um, here's one of the mines that we visited. And so Wim is standing on a, on a small ledge, looking at a very tall table. The table has been put there in order to dump material in. And you can see on the left of the picture, uh, the material has been trolleyed into this trommel area there. And then through, through, uh, through gravitation, they've pulled the heavy materials and dumped them on the table. So of course, Wim is there examining everything. The, the man sort of uh, standing on his, or uh, sitting on his haunches, is making sure that uh, everything's above uh, par. Uh, there are three other people that are standing on this ledge looking at material and you're seeing, I mean, rubies and spinels, but really overseeing everything is the overseer. <laughs> and he's standing there at the left to make sure that everything is kosher. It, this, this is actually my favorite kind of office. Yeah, exactly. Well, this picture I took in Mandalay at, this, at the scene of the Jadeite market there. And what you, what, the way you go to that market is you wake up at four in the morning because it's a nighttime market. You need the darkness to be able to examine Jadeite material. And I absolutely love this photo. It's one of my favorites that I've, that I've taken on a trip because there's sort of this diagonal trench of people Everybody is completely focused on what they're doing and uh, engrossed in, in finding that one piece of jade that might strike riches for them. All the way from the young face on the far right to the very concentrated face there in the middle. And then if you look diagonally off to the top left, there's, there's a, another man there with his light, just it looks almost like a candle. It's, it's almost mystical in, in its, um, in the way it was portrayed. Uh, Wim and I were walking through this area and he said to me at one point, hey Robert, don't take any pictures right now. Just stop and listen. Wim, why don't you take it from there? Yeah, so I think that is something, while I was at that market, I had done some research on Jade before going there. And I remember from uh, a podcast, I believe, that it was, I think it was Doug Hucker, who, uh, who is in charge of AGTA, who made the statement that jade is a gem that appeals to all the senses. And I was thinking about that, and it is at that uh, market that I really realized it. Like, I mean, the feeling of jade, first of all, like you have the touch of jade, especially rough jade, which is something special. You have a lot of different textures, but also, the way that market feels. You're in a city, uh, Mandalay, which is famous for its tropical, sweltering, humid climate, but it's actually pretty chilly in the morning when we're there. So it's, it's, an, it's a feeling that you don't really associate with the city. Um, then you have all the smells that are going on there. Of course, this is morning. A lot of these guys want their breakfast. So you have super strong coffee brewing. You have all kinds of different soups and stews brewing. So there's all these exotic smells and spices. 
that you smell going on there. Of course, you have the amazing visual spectacle of the pitch black night, and then uh, you have the bright torches flashing through it like lightsabers, and then you have the green glow when they actually put it on the jade. But then what, what I liked best was just the sound of it. When you hit, when two jade, pieces of jade hit each other, it makes the most amazing, clear, pure sound. It's a clinking like I've never heard before. So when these guys go through these parcels of all these different shards and blocks and pieces of jade, it makes the most amazing tinkling noise uh, that I've ever heard. And it was just worth it to just close our eyes, stand there for a minute and listen to that sound in that market. Yes, absolutely. It's almost like, like wind chimes. And, and I'm glad that you stopped me because uh, really you're right. It was a feast for the senses, for all of our senses. And, and it's very hard to know where to focus or look because there's so much activity going on in that market at every possible level. So this is a completely different market. Uh, this is the close to the Longido Ruby Mines. And it's a photo that I took last summer when we were visiting there. And you see that all these guys, the Maasai uh, that are the locals there, uh, Longido is a Maasai village. Um, they are looking at tiny rubies that you see on that blue table. Now, when I say the name Longido, people don't really associate that with very high quality ruby. When you say Longido, people think about the ruby and zoicide. Uh, these massive, almost football-sized ruby crystals in that green matrix, but all of it is mostly opaque. So it's used for the most spectacular carvings, but it is not considered a top ruby. Now, a few years ago, in those mines, in the hard rock mines, they found levels where the, where the ruby material is actually of high gem quality when it is fractured in small enough pieces. So those tiny pieces, they're excellent to cut small, tiny rubies off. They have an ex extremely good fluorescence. They hold their color really well in those small sizes. So a huge market developed in that town. And when I first visited four years ago, Longido was just a small settlement, a couple of huts, no electricity, a small water well. Um, a few herds of goats around because Maasai, when they get uh, more money, they'll invest in more livestock. So the more cows, the more sheep, the more goats a Maasai has, the richer he actually is. So when we went back uh, last year, we saw that the whole town had changed. There was electricity. There were a lot of buildings being built in brick. There was a market with more than 100 people there. Right outside the village around the water well, we could see a lot of cows, a lot of goats. So this new ruby find, well, this, it's not really a new find, but this new quality that they've started finding there has really lifted the entire level of that village and that entire community just by finding those gemstones. And I think a role that we cannot underestimate in uh, a lot of gemstone mining communities are the ladies. Uh, these women are actually mining, they are processing the tailings of the old mines. So the mines are all underground, hard rock, but they bring up all that rubble. And when the rubble is discarded, the low grade material, these ladies can go out and they can process it. They can hammer it, tap away at it and get these tiny rubies out. So they make a living off that. And there's a lot of these ladies just sitting around those mines, collecting piles of this rubble and tapping away with their hammers to get those small rubies out. So the role of women in a lot of mining communities, a lot of trading communities is often very underestimated. I always have the feeling that when I go to gem shows, when I go to um, international trade events, it is very male dominated. A lot of boots are owned by company le companies led by mines. Um, while a lot of, I think when people think of women in the jewelry, they traditionally think maybe designers, but usually the end clientele. But nobody realizes the role that women play all the way at the beginning of the cycle of gemstones. How many women miners are out there? How many women traders are in there? And what an important role that they play in the entire story of gemstones. Yeah, very true. And I'd like to just add one thing. Christina Villegas uh, reminded me of it uh, last time that I gave a talk. She said, you know, don't, 
don't forget to tell people that that women are doing a lot of the hard work too. They're actually out there hewing rock, uh, drilling, doing things that uh, people associate mostly with men. They're doing a lot of the heavy work as well, but also a lot of the business work. Oh, so yeah, this is another photo of the, our Robert and mine's favorite market, the Mandalay Jade Market in the morning. So this is a picture that I took across the street where you see this young woman entertaining her child. She's taking care of her family, taking care of her child. But at the meantime, she's also taking care of her business. So she's combining her family and her business, like she's entertaining this kid. But at the same time, she has an inventory of high quality jade rough in front of her that she's actively trying to sell. And just minutes after I took this photo, there's a, buy, there's a potential buyer who stopped. She fiercely negotiated for a builder. They didn't reach a price. And it was very obvious that she was in charge of that negotiation and that she was leading it. And it was on her terms that that boulder was going to be sold. And it didn't sell because the buyer didn't want to match the price. So this lady skilled in business, running her family, and obviously still very young, a force to be reckoned with in the jade market, but also in the entire gem market. Yeah. Um, I'm going to apologize. I think I skipped over an image. Well, maybe not. Oh, here it is. Um, again, uh, this is one of the markets that is in Mo the city of Mogok, and it's basically a, a large uh, warehouse. And all of the people that are selling in there are women. They're actually running the business. And, and this is a centuries old tradition in Myanmar, in Burma, because uh, the, the women uh, just have a, a better sense of business, it seems. And uh, also, from what I read in Ted Thamelis' book, there is sort of an under the table communication system that was, was sometimes employed, especially in the older days where they could tap each other's knees to help um, each other when negotiating prices. Uh, they just had a much better sense of, of, uh, of value, a much better sense of, of business. Uh, this lady right here is selling spinel. Uh, but you can see pretty much everything that uh, that she has out, laid out on the table right there in front of in front of her. Pretty amazing. And then remember the jadeite uh, market in Mandalay. Well, right next to that market, there's a daytime jadeite market for buyers to come and buy finished goods. So the whole area around this market is is filled with with cutters and with various people but again you know it's the it's the ladies the women in, in in Myanmar that are actually doing the business and here's a whole row of them and you might notice the the markings on their cheeks that's called tanaka and it's a mixture an amalgam of, of various substances and some tree bark um, often used as sort of a sunscreen but also as a beauty mark Well, now we'll talk a little bit about pearls. This is a trip that I had the great opportunity to go on. Uh, it was right after an ICA Congress and we were in Dubai. We had a chance to go visit a pearl farm. Now what's unique about these two pictures is that uh, in the entire Middle East, uh, there's not much valuation for uh, cultured pearls. There's very little. Everybody wants the natural product, but there's not enough to go around. So this one group called Rack Pearls decided to actually create a pearl farm there just north of Dubai, about two hour drive. And we were invited to go, Donna Durlam and myself, and we sat on this ship, watched the entire harvest. And then he brought out all of these incredible boxes of fabulous pearls to show us. Really quite an amazing thing. And these are in the neighborhood of eight to 12 millimeters in diameter. Very nice luster, very beautiful, but they're cultured. So I think they're still trying to make inroads into the society, which is heavily influenced by wanting natural pearls. Um, this is another picture that I took 
uh, of, of pearls. It's the other side of the world. So here we're back in Myanmar. Uh, we had the opportunity to visit the Myanmar Gems Emporium, which last week's session was all about, but that focused mainly on the jades. Uh, jade is the most important gem in Myanmar. But Myanmar is also a source of cultured pearls, mainly what they call the golden pearls. So you can see that this young lady is inspecting this pearl and you can just see the focus in her eyes, the way that she's studying this gem, this beautiful lustrous pearl, this golden South Sea pearl. And that just, for me, this picture shows that the role that women play in that whole story, because almost every buyer for, that, uh, for the pearl lots was a woman. And this, this young lady was there with her mother, obviously in a running a family business. But I think pearls are some of the hardest gems to evaluate. Because a pearl, a pearl's value is not only in the pearl itself. It is also how does this pearl compare to the other pearls. It is very, very rare that you actually see pearls used alone. And I think more people are familiar with faceted gemstones. And everyone who has sorted faceted gemstones and tried to make matching pairs knows what a headache that is. But if you try to do this with pearls, there's so much factors that you need to account for. Are they exactly the same size when, because not every round is the same roundness. Are they exactly the same color? Do they have the same luster? Is the surface of the same quality? Do they have the same overtone? So there's a lot of expertise that goes in that and that is passed in these Burmese families from mother to daughter. Yeah. Okay, so we'll now sort of go to people in nature pictures. And this is one that I took um, in India maybe a few years ago. And there's a camel market in a town called Pushkar. The camel market occurs in, in October. I love this picture because it's sort of the fading sunset, sunlight of the day. It's, it's sunset all across the distance you're seeing the humps of different camels that are being brought to this market to trade. And um, you're seeing the camel herders taking utmost care of the camels, hoping to sell them at the highest possible price, actually using uh, machines to cut into the fur to create these little patterns that you see there. And I love this, uh, this spot um, very much because it was just so picturesque. And, Right about this time, people are putting wood fires together and cooking. So all of those wisps of smoke are, are rising into the atmosphere, creating a, a scene. Now, it wasn't until I, I returned from this trip that I found out that Pushkar is actually an ancient place. And it was along the Silk Road, the Silk Road where so many gems have been traded for, for centuries, uh, gems coming from Burma and moving west towards Europe and the Americas, emeralds from South America moving east towards India where there was such an affinity for those green gemstones. And many of them may have passed through the place, this place called Pushkar. And what struck me also as, as interesting is that it, I can't imagine that much would have changed at this place. I imagine that the scene was very similar as people walked around trying to sell and uh, really beautify their camels in order to make them more saleable. At that same market, uh, we had a, a driver that took us from the hotel by camel with pull, uh, pulling a cart with us on it. The man on the left is that camel cart driver. And we got into a conversation and we chatted he lit up a few cigarettes, he was a chain smoker. And I asked him if I could start taking some pictures and he, he said yes. So I started taking many, many pictures and then increasingly I could see that he was getting a little bit impatient. So I took this one last picture. This was the last picture in that whole series. And when I came home and processed the images, I saw, first of all, his, that glint of his eye through the smoke, which I absolutely I love that, that being able to have captured that. But then I saw that weird little string that was tucked between his fingers. I don't know if it was there as a reminder for him to do something or, or what, but uh, 
there it was. And the picture on the right, same as at the, at the Camel Fair, but it's, it's the place where kids would have gone to enjoy uh, the Ferris wheel or anything else, very much like any of our societies here that enjoy that kind of a, a ride and, and that much fun. This young lady was probably her first time. Her mother had brought her here. There is the mother wanting to make sure she's safe. And I took a picture against that scene with the Ferris wheel. So I think this is a picture that I took that will probably bring me closest to the Lion King opening scene that I will ever be. Um, for me, I have great memories about taking this picture. This is in the Umba Valley in Tanzania, where we were seated on top of a hill, watching the sunset after a long day of looking for sapphires. And those of you that are familiar with Umba sapphires know that Umba is known for its typical colors. The Umba sapphire are usually what we call a modified orange. It's like a golden orange, a pinkish orange, a yellowish orange, a brownish orange, a reddish orange. And I mean, all those colors, we saw those flashing in front of our eyes during that sunset in a span of five or six minutes. And I was seated there with a friend who's a gemologist and a jeweler. And you see that little tree a little bit to the right of the center. That's the, that was our marking point. And when we saw the color behind that, we would say like, this is my favorite Umba sapphire color. No, this is my favorite Umba sapphire color. And I think we must have said it 20 times in like five minutes, because it was just such a beautiful moment uh, up there in remote part of Northern Tanzania. Yeah, it's, it's beautiful. And you know that as we start looking at sunset pictures, you know that the, the presentation is probably wrapping up or coming to a close but there's always nighttime. So we're not quite done yet, but we're close. This is the legendary city of Mogok. And there is the Chantaji Pagoda, which is one centerpiece of that city. The city itself is spectacularly beautiful. And that, that pagoda it's, is, is just something to behold. And it's all lit up like a fabulous layer cake at night. And uh, then you've got the entire village Everyone makes their living on rubies and sapphires here. Um, that, that watch this beautiful scene unfold every single evening. I love the place. Now, what you're looking at is a lake. That is the Mio Le Lake. And it was basically not a lake uh, about 100 years ago when the Burma ruby mines were here. The spot with water that you're looking at is actually the site of the Burma ruby mines which was later flooded, and uh, this is the lake that you see now. Very beautiful. Now, I had, I had gone down an embankment so I could get the lowest possible angle, so I could get the reflection of the, of the pagoda all the way in the water. And it was spectacularly beautiful. I had my camera on a tripod, and I was sitting there, and all around me, again, it's the sounds of the night, and I, I heard toads uh, croaking in, in all directions. And right about then, this, this uh, woman walks by the top of the embankment and she says, do you hear the toads? And I said, yeah, I, I hear the toads. And then she kept walking, but then she called over her shoulder, and you know what eats toads? Well, it took me a while to figure it out, but there's a picture of a toad with the pagoda in the background. What she was talking about was basically cobras, snakes. Uh, this was the Valley of Serpents at one time. So when uh, all of Rudyard Kipling's descriptions of uh, cobras came to mind, I decided to just get out of that lake as soon as possible. <laughs> but it reminded me that all over the world, people have a wonderful sense of humor in the case of this Burmese lady, it was a very subtle sense of humor that only got to my brain uh, a little while later. And with that, I think we're concluding this, this talk. And so uh, I'll let you speak to Kelly now. Yes, so this is absolutely fantastic. I think I can kind of speak for everyone saying these are like, you know, such amazing stories that we're so happy we have a chance to hear for the first time. 
Uh, we got a lot of great questions, so I'm going to just jump right into it. I know we're running a little, we're, we're just about at the end of the hour, but please stick with us. We have a, uh, we'll, we'll go through a few questions as much as we can in, in the time that we have. Uh, so, Wim, do they mine for marble as well as the rubies in, Mo in Mogok? Well, not that I'm aware of. I think most of the mining in Mogok is focused on gemstones. I mean, they're not only mining rubies there, they're mining a lot of spinel and sapphire and basically every other gem you can think of. Um, so I, I don't think they're mining for marble. Of course, they use some of the marble rubble to build houses, but they're not really focusing on that marble as a decorative material or a construction material. Okay. Um, why is jadeite, uh, why, why does it need to be nighttime in the market for um, everyone to inspect the jadeite? Well, let me see if I can tackle that one. Uh, at night with a torch, you don't have any distractions. You can actually shine a light uh, through a piece and begin to understand whether there is a vein of color in it at a certain point, which will pay off. Uh, so people really want, if you're in a very well-lit room, you may not see that by transmitting light through it. But as I understand, there are other reasons that the marketplace takes place at night, and I'm not sure about what those are. Uh, I gave a talk two weeks ago, and uh, one of the comments that I had from, from someone who looked at a similar picture was, there are other reasons for the nighttime market. Wim, do you know what those might be, or Aaron? I'm, I'm not sure. Um, I, I've, I've been told that the main reason is that just a complete absence of light, which means that you can see all the subtleties when you shine your torch. And I think if you want to better understand the subtleties of jade, you can watch last week's webinar, which focused on jade, especially Burmese jade and how those people approach it. Um, yeah. So I think there it is really highlighted how subtle it is to see the differences in jade. So I think the least, let's call it contamination that you have, and the more focused that you can do your uh, studying of those pieces, uh, the better it becomes. Absolutely. And I, I do recall also from Dr. Tao's uh, talk that, that sometimes people use water to, to, uh, to sort of coat the surface of the jade so that they can actually see through it just a little bit better. And I did see a little, uh, basically a Pepsi bottle or a 7-Up bottle cut in half where there was water inside. And I saw someone dipping their hands and then rubbing it across the surface, transmitting light, really trying to catch that color. As with all colored gemstones, the most important thing that you can find is color. And the gamble with jade is that you just don't know. It's, it's a rock. And you don't know until you've really done every possible thing to look at it. You've sliced it, you've cut it, you've diced it in different directions. And it's only after you've completed all sorts of different um, possibilities that you begin to see if this piece might have some value to it. And even then, you don't know what the depth of the color is. It may taper off at one point, as Dr. Tao so beautifully explained. So jade is one of those gamble stones. And, and I like the whole concept that that this gambling takes place under the cover of darkness. That's great. Um, for the Longuito small, uh, fine small rubies, what host rock are those in? I think those are actually exactly the same as the classic Longuito material. Um, so it's, it's a rock that they call aniolite from the Maasai word for green, anioli. Um, so it's these big red crystals of ruby that are actually, I mean, they, they're the size of your head basically sometimes, mm -hmm. um, but they're usually opaque. But when you break them into little pieces, sometimes those small pieces, they become transparent or translucent. And the level that they're mining at right now, I'm gonna say it's level 12, but that, don't quote me on that, um, actually has some better crystallized material. So the pieces that were the sizes where this material becomes transparent, translucent, are a little bigger than usual. Yeah. It's exactly the same material. It looks exactly the same. It's just a little bit better crystallization. And sometimes you see them combined with zoocyte. So you'll see these fabulous hexagonal ruby crystals in a green host material that's surrounding it. And, and that is zoocyte. It's, it's a green zoocyte. And so the carvings that uh, Wim was talking about earlier 
often take place uh, with one stone. It's the ruby in zoocyte that is being that is being carved. That's great. Um, Robert, you talked about the gem guide that you produced, uh, or that you know GI produced in um, conjunction with PAC. And it, where where can people find that book, or where is that distributed? Well, right now we have a, a limited supply of those, and those are intended to go straight to the miners themselves. So we don't have any available for sort of widespread distribution. In the library, with which I'm the director, we do have many copies that, that students can look at um, and and check it out and check out. Now, at some point, because um, that, that program has been very successful, we do want to make it available to a much wider public so that they can see. We also want to en enhance it in, in other ways, add a little bit more gemological um, uh, know-how. Uh, we really stayed away from, the, from, from gemology for the most part. I mean, we used some gemological concepts because in many cases, these are, these are minors who may not know how to read or write. So not only are we doing that, but we're adding video component where we can show people what to do in certain situations, like uh, for example, immersion, how you can immerse a material, a rough material to actually see into it a little bit better along the same concept as the, the, what we were talking about with the jade. But for now, it's sort of, um, we're still holding it close to the chest. Great. Uh... Do the women who are, um, you know, in the business of selling gems and, and mining the gems, are they getting uh, equal pay and compensation as the men do? And, or is it more of like a communal effort where what everyone finds is sold and then income is evenly split? Or do you know, do we have any, do you know about um, how women are compensated in the roles that they're taking along the supply chain? Hmm, why that's a good question, a tough one. It's a tough I, one. Yeah, and I'm not sure, I'm not sure we know that exactly. I would say that uh, from having spoken with Cristina Villegas from PACT, it is her experience, I think that um, a lot of the women are undercompensated. And even though they're doing, you know, a lot of the work at those mines themselves and doing a lot of the work later with, with running the business, um, that being said, I think we've moved forward quite a bit in the last decade or so because now they have associations, women's minors associations, where uh, there's more focus being, being uh, and attention being paid on them than there was before. And they're having much more of a seat at the table than they've had before. I'm not saying by any stretch that it's, that that's the end of it. It needs to progress and, and, uh, and get much better even than that. But uh, Wim, I don't know if you have anything to add on that. Yeah, I think just about payment, I think uh, the concept of salaries is something that is not really applicable in most situations. I mean, these people, they find some stones and they sell them right away. Uh, usually it is independent people. These people work for themselves. Uh, sometimes they organize them in groups, so it's different all over the world. Mm -hmm. um, but I, yeah, like Robert said, I think um, the role of women is becoming more known, which allows them to take their to get closer to their rightful place at the table and to get closer to their rightful part of the whole uh, sum that becomes the jewelry. Yeah, I'd like to add one thing, if I may, and that is that, uh, you know, in, in, in Myanmar, in Burma, the role of the woman has been, has been going on for centuries. And some of those women are very powerful and, and very wealthy. So I think in, 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 in Myanmar, that has developed on a much more equitable scale. In fact, I'd say that in many cases that they're, they're higher than than the man in, in the way they're being compensated. Maybe that's wrong, but I think in many cases that's, that's true. I think in East Africa where gems really have only been around for the past 50 years or so, colored gemstones, um, that evolution has, been, has taken a much longer time to develop. And I think, uh, I think governments are also very interested in increasing the role of women. And so I know that in, in Tanzania, 
there is a great effort to, by the government to make sure that women are, are treated in a more equitable way. Great, thank you for your honest answer. I know that's a tough question. Um, also, uh, kind of switching gears a little bit to go back to the Pearl Farm in Dubai. Robert, what was the name of that Pearl Farm? It's the Rock R-A-K, Pearl Farm. And, okay, uh, great. That's, that's the name of it. And it's in a, in a region, and right now the name of that region is escaping me, but it's, it's just north of Dubai a couple of hours. Okay. Um, does a lot of mining in any region affect any of the natural magnetic fields and impact the climate, or is most mi mining fairly safe for the environment? Uh, I think most mining is pretty safe for the environment in terms of in terms of gemstone mining. So a lot of the mining, for, especially for colored stones, is happening in what we call secondary deposits, where the gemstones have weathered out of rocks over millions of years, and they're found in um, you know old stream beds and rivers and gravels. So a lot of this is just moving dirt, um, which it can have some environmental implications if you're not. Um, if all that sediment gets washed down into the streams, that can potentially cause problems. But usually the volumes that we're dealing with in terms of rock that's being moved around is relatively small compared to a lot of other types of mining. Um, big problems are, you know, water usage and, and the release of uh, sediment into streams. But in most cases, it's not, it's not a huge impact on the environment. And it's it, things like magnetic fields and that sort of thing is not really affected too much by um, mining process in most cases. Yeah. When okay. you want to add um, anything to that? Yeah, I want to, I would just want to add one thing that for gemstone mining, I have never seen any chemicals being used. You do not need chemicals to mine gemstones, which is a different story for gold. Like for gold, a lot of artisanal gold miners are using mercury, which is extremely poisonous and it contaminates the entire water ecosystem. For gemstone mining, that is never the case. You do not need any solvents. You do not need any uh, heavy liquids. It's just water and forces that you need. Um, so I think most of the mining that we see, especially because a lot of mining is artisanal miners, small scale, are fairly small operations that have low impact for a short while. I mean, if you look at the larger, sometimes a hole in the ground can look terrible. But if you go back two years later, when that mine is abandoned, it is completely overgrown and nature has reclaimed it. So I think those low impact mines do not, um, I mean, it's all in the name. They're all fairly low impact. Great. Yeah, and, and just, to, to, just as a final thought, I know that a lot of governments are, are concerned about that very issue. And uh, there are a lot of uh, mining laws that are being promulgated and changed as we speak in, in East African countries, in Burma also, in, in Myanmar. Uh, so they're taking a lot of that aspect of the environmental recovery into, into consideration as well. Perfect. So Alice's last question, because we're about 15 minutes over, but what are the educational requirements to becoming a field gemologist? How do you get into the field? How do you get access to these, um, you know, incredible locations? Like, where do you start if you want to be a field gemologist? That's a whim question. <laughs> I mean, it, it's, a, it's a difficult one. Um, I think field, yeah, field gemology at GIA is part of the research. So right now, this isn't highlighted. We've highlighted everything around the core mission of field gemology. But the main reason why we go to all these places is to collect samples, samples that we can use for studies, samples that we can use for research projects. So GIA field gemology is part of the research team. So actually we're all, we're all scientists working in that research team. Um, so basically from that science angle, people can go into the field to collect their samples. Of course, depending on what role you're in, that happens more or less. Um, but going into the field, there are more and more people right now that go into the field also for, tr for a trade perspective uh, that go closer to the mines. Because I think information and access, access to that information, access to those mines has never been better. 
Um, I mean, when Robert went to Tanzania 30 years ago, I can't even imagine how that started. While right now it is fairly easy. You go, you go to Wikipedia, you search up what Tanzania, you look up what Tanzania is like, and you book a ticket to Tanzania. Through Facebook, it's so easy to find a gemstone community and to find some people based there that within a few days, you can find a reliable contact that, to reach out to that can help you while you're on the, on the ground there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I'm going to say right here and now that I'm not a field gemologist in the classic sense. Um, I run a library, but people do know that I photograph people and gemstones. I have a great passion for it. And um, I'm very, very interested in the historic and cultural aspects that, that we see where, when we are in those places. And I think they're part of that gemstone story. They're very much part of, of everything. So that was really the genesis of this talk, that we, we wanted to come up with something that talks about place, talks about people, talks about the senses, talks about the beauty of gemstones and where they come from. And I think that's a perfect place to wrap it up. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining and sticking with us uh, a little later. Uh, if you have any other questions for us, you know, please find us on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Uh, and thank you all for coming. And thank you to uh, Robert, Wim, and Aaron. You did an incredible job. And a you know, special shout out to Wim for doing this at midnight his time. So uh, well, it's past midnight, much past midnight now. So um, thank you all for coming. And please join us again next week, where we'll be talking to Chen Hui's Chu, who will tell us all about pearl identification and the techniques and challenges that come with it. So thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank Have you. a great day, everyone. You can see you tomorrow, Wim. <laughs>